Welcome to the Keeping It Israel podcast with Jeff Futers, where Jeff and his guests talk everything Israel as it relates to Christian faith and the church. If you are a Christian and you stand with Israel, you will be encouraged and challenged by this podcast. And if you're not so sure about the whole Israel thing, you need to learn how your faith connects with Israel and why standing with Israel matters. Now here's Jeff with today's guest. Hi, my name is Jeff, and I'll be your host today. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. My guest today is Itamar Marcus of Palestinian Media Watch, and he's going to share with us some of the hard truth about what is happening between Israel and the Palestinians, and also some of the terrible brainwashing that is going on uh, by Palestinian leaders of their young people and their children. Uh, this may be a little alarming to you, but I believe it will be eye-opening. I want to point out here at the beginning that we are in no way trying to cast a negative aspersion on the Palestinians. Many of the Palestinians are victims themselves, and so uh, we really are just interested in sharing truth. And so let's listen in to Itamar Marcus. Well, thank you for joining us for the podcast today. And uh, my guest today is Itamar Marcus. And uh, Itamar, you are the head of Palestinian Media Watch. What is Palestinian Media Watch? Well, we were founded um, really right after the Oslo Accords. And our goal was to find out what the Palestinians um, were telling their people. What were they educating their people? What were they teaching their children? Uh, we wanted to know if there was a sincere peace process going on. Um, and to this end, we literally, over 20 years, we've been studying everything that we could about the Palestinian Authority uh, from the open sources. We study, we follow all their TV, we read their newspapers, we, uh, we study their, their school books. And when I say we follow everything, we study their sports pages, their cultural pages, their music videos, um, everything about them in order to get a real sense of what's happening in the PA world. And what we've learned is there are two completely different messages. There is the message they give to their own people through everything, through culture, sports, uh, school books. And that's completely different than the message that they're giving the international community. And I'll just give you an interesting example, some, some examples from sports, because people say, you know, why are you reading the sports pages? What, what can you find yeah. there? Well, I'll give you some examples. Uh, the Palestinian Authority uses sports in order to role model for their young people and their, 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 their students and their children by naming sporting events after the terrorists, who, those who've really murdered the largest number of Israelis. Um, we have, wow. just last year, we had a karate tournament for young women named after a Palestinian female terrorist, Dalal Mogrivi, who led a bus hijacking in which 12 children were murdered. And uh, in addition to 25 adults, it was the worst attack in Israel's history. 37 people murdered, led by Dalal Mugrabi, and then there was a karate tournament named for her. Uh, just a few months before then, the Palestinian Authority Ministry of Education sponsored an entire sports festival named after this killer. Uh, and, and, and all the girls, we have the picture, all the girls who were participating in the sports festival actually wore a uniform for the entire festival that had a picture of this killer, this picture of this mass murderer of children on it. So sports is used um, as a way to role model. And we have dozens of these examples every year of sporting events named after terrorists. Um, on the other hand, they prohibit peace sporting events between Israelis and Palestinian youth. Uh, mm. In fact, Palestinian adults as well. There have been there have been a few sporting events that actually happened under the radar, and then we see Palestinian Authority leadership ripping into the people who were involved in in, in good peace building, uh, and in fact saying that they want to put them on trial for for treason. Uh, there was one case where a Palestinian boy who was interviewed in a newspaper said that he learned from one day of sports with Israelis that it's better to have peace than war, and he doesn't want to have war anymore. And in response to this event, there were members of the Palestinian Authority Olympic Committee who called for the arrest of the organizers. So peace building through sports is prohibited. 
by glorifying wow. terrorists through sports. Uh, and this is a real tragedy because we know the impact that sports can have on, on children, on youth, on adults. Uh, and this is, though, unfortunately, an indicator mm-hmm. of how important it is to follow everything that's going on in the Palestinian world uh, to find out the, the 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 goals and the ideologies and what the leadership really wants for their people. Incredible. So uh, you've given a great example and um, partially answered the next question, but uh, I know there are many, many other examples as well. You know, what the work that you're doing, why is that so important uh, that we get this message out? This This work is critical because um, the international community and to a certain extent, even the Israeli leadership um, was not aware until we started studying their school books, studying their media, was not aware that the whole so-called peace process was a, was a fraud. Uh, we started reporting on this in the late 1990s. We started in yeah. 1996 and, and, and I'll, I remember the, the, the media was responding to us and saying, well, there's a peace process going on now. It doesn't matter what they're saying. It doesn't matter what they're doing. And we were saying, mm-hmm. no, listen to what they're saying. Listen to what they're teaching their children. Listen to what they're writing in the school books. There is no peace process going on. There's a hate process going on. There's a terror process going on. Uh, and tragically, Israelis only learned through the uh, in 2000 when the Palestinian Authority launched its terror war, its four-year terror war, in which we lost over a thousand killed, uh, Mm. tens of thousands injured. um, And it was all because we were literally suckered into believing that there was a serious peace process going on. We never fought the Palestinian Authority um, in 2000, 2001. uh, We never fought them properly because we, we somehow believed their myth and their lie that that is the leadership did that this was a spontaneous terror coming from the bottom. In fact, we, PMW, Palestinian Media Watchers, arguing all the time that we had all the proof that the Palestinian leadership was behind it. And eventually, eventually, the Palestinian leadership, after it was over, uh, they admitted to it. We have films of all their leaders saying, admitting that they were responsible for all these murders. Mahmoud Abbas. He is the leader today. He is the one who the world sees as a leader. Well, Mahmoud Abbas should be serving multiple life sentences for murder, and I'll tell you why. Because he was, uh, he he was actually the the prime minister as part of the time of this intifada, what they call intifada, the terror war. And when he was interviewed in two thousand and five, after it had ended, and at this point he was a so called president of the Palestinian Authority, uh, he went on TV and said, "All the prisoners." have to be released, all the Palestinian prisoners who were in Israeli jails. And what was his reason? Because he said, we, 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 the Palestinian Authority sent them. So you have mass murderers in jail. He wants them free because we sent them. Well, if you sent them, Mahmoud Abbas, you should be serving life sentences as well. Uh, In fact, hundreds of life sentences because you're responsible for those murders. Unfortunately, the world decided to make a blind decision that because he's head of the PA, he's a peace partner. And he has been lying to the international community and to Israeli leadership and to everybody ever since. And we catch his lies all the time. Mm. Wow. It's interesting, you know, to listen to you talk because when you, uh, when you watch what's being showed in the media here in North America, um, often Israel gets painted as... Uh, the you know the the bad country the aggressor. Um, how would you characterize Israel's relationship with Palestine in general? I'd say Israel has done more good for the Palestinian Authority than anyone else in history. Hmm. Uh, let's go to the period before the Palestinian Authority, pre nineteen ninety three, and the Oslo Accords. Um, Israel saw the Palestinians as her neighbors. We wanted to help improve their lives. We wanted to, uh, we had open borders. Uh, From 1967, when Judea and Samaria came under Israeli rule with all of the Arab population that was there, um, everything that happened to them was only growth and prosperity. Uh, For example, uh, healthcare. Um, 
life expectancy when we Israel took over in 1967 life expectancy for Arabs there was 47 mm -hmm. when Israel gave it over to the PA we had raised it up to 73 uh, in in a few years after we took over the land their economy was the fourth fastest growing economy in the world that is the, the residents of Judea and Samaria the West Bank for that, why? Because Israel was giving them all the latest technology, um, drip, agriculture, everything that we had that was helping us thrive economically, we were giving giving to them. When when we took over the West Bank, uh, less than 10% of Palestinians had running water in their homes and electricity and gas. And when we gave it over, it was over 80%. So Israel was just a good neighbor. Yeah. And then we signed uh, an accords with Yasser Arafat and the PLO under the mistaken assumption that they would then take all this goodwill that had been built up over the years and that would be translated into a peaceful, some kind of a peaceful entity next to us. There, right after the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, there were polls that were taken by the most important Palestinian pollster. His name is Khalil Shkaki. And these polls indicate that everything I was I just described to you, what all the good that Israel did for the local population was recognized. Let me just tell you what these polls were. Um, in 1996 through 2000, this, this pollster asked every year, he asked Palestinians um, to rate four places in the world in democracy and human rights. Now, basically, he wanted to know how they rated Palestinian democracy, but he did a comparison, France, United States, and Israel, and the PA. So in 1996, now that means 30 years after Israel took over Judea and Samaria and the Arab residents. So 30 years of Israeli rule, Palestinians mm -hmm. were asked to rate four places in democracy and human rights. Well, they gave their own leadership, the PA, 50% positive rating. 55% uh, gave France a positive rating. 65% gave the United States a positive rating. And where was Israel? Israel was the best in the world. Israel, 78% of Palestinians gave Israel a positive rating in democracy and human rights after 30 years of Israeli rule. And this was 28% higher than they were giving their own leaders. Well, the next year, he did the same poll, and this confirmed it. It was 77%. The next year, he did the same poll. And Israel was at 75% going down. The next year, it again, Israel was to 65%. But then again, so did the PA. The PA was down at 22% positive. In other words, the longer the Palestinian population was under the Palestinian Authority, the worse their conditions were, the more they forgot Israel's good things that we did for them. This was down in just three years, four years, they went down from 78 to 65 But it wasn't Israel. It was because of the PA. And like I said, the PA went down to 22% positive. So Israel just wanted to be a good neighbor. Like I say, we established that. By the way, we also opened up all their universities. They had no universities that were started when Jordan ruled the area. Right. We opened their, all, their, all their universities. So, so Israel, education, health, uh, economics, um, infrastructure. Israel was an incredible neighbor. We really established them. And in return, we signed with the Oslo Accords, and the tragedy was is that we didn't just take local population and work out a deal with the local population. We signed with Yasser Arafat and the PLO terrorists, who at that time were in Tunisia. They, we allowed them to come into the Palestinian areas, and they immediately got control of education, of welfare, of, 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 of school books. They start, And all of a sudden, they started immediately started poisoning the minds of the Palestinian people. They started rewriting history. They started terror attacks. Within a few years, we started having suicide bombings that we never had before. Um, the first suicide bombings were done by Hamas, but they wouldn't have been done without the Palestinian Authority uh, permission. Hmm. Uh, so we immediately, immediately, by starting a so-called peace process, ended up having terror rising to the, not just tens and 15 percents, but many hundreds of percents more terror from a situation where we had isolated terror attacks, uh, a number of terror attacks every year. Uh, we were having eventually a number of terror attacks every day. Uh, and this was thanks to a wow. so-called peace process. 
and so the timing of that, you know, I remember, I remember video of, uh, you know, when Gaza was turned back over to the Palestinian Authority and, and seeing beautiful uh, greenhouses and, and other things uh, bulldozed to the ground. That was all around this time of, of uh, beginning a so-called peace process. Yeah. And I have to make one correction. You said you remember when Gaza was returned to the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority, there was no such thing as a Palestinian Authority before the Oslo Accords. We weren't returning anything to them. We were giving. We were giving something to the Palestinians. We were accepting something that never existed before. There had never been a Palestinian nation, a Palestinian people, a Palestinian king, a Palestinian state. Nothing had ever been Palestinian. Um, the only Palestinians in the world actually had been the Jews. Right. Uh, the, the, the Romans renamed the Judea in one in 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 one twenty five one thirty five. Uh, they renamed it uh, Palestina, and from then on, it was the Jews who were there who were Palestinians. Um, the Palestinian Talmud was written in five hundred six hundred uh, Common Era. Palestinian Talmud, I assure you, it wasn't Yasser Arafat's relatives who wrote it. Uh, and that was all through till yeah. the 20th century. Uh, there was the Palestine Patas organization, which was an Israel, it was, was a Jewish Zionist you know, organization in the 19th. And there was the Palestinian uh, uh, Philharmonic. And all of these were, were Zionist Jewish uh, structures that eventually turned into the Israeli state. So they, they dropped Palestine. The Jerusalem Post was originally the Palestine Post. Uh, the Israeli yes. Philharmonic was the Palestine Philharmonic. So what happened was, it's like, it's like if you had your driver's license and you lost it and someone took your driver's license and then decided to not only steal your name, but steal your identity. And that's what's happened here with, the, with Yasser Arafat. We were the ones who were known as Palestinians until we created the state of Israel. Uh, and Yasser Arafat says, hey, you know what? I have an idea. Let's take the name Palestine, claim we're the Palestinians, and then we can... Uh, actually go back and take their whole history. Mm. And in fact, that is what he has done. And you, going all the way back, even to Jesus. Jesus, a Judean, a practicing Judean, is now, according to the Palestinian Authority, a Palestinian. So everything, everything was stolen. Our history, uh, people, famous, famous Jews, uh, everybody uh, have all been stolen, all because of the stealing of the name Palestinian. Yeah, thank you for correcting me. Uh, I, you are correct. Giving, not returning, and uh, it's it's really there was a kind of a vacuum created when the Jewish state uh, was created because now the identity was was completely Jewish and and the identity was around Israel, and that left that term Palestinian just kind of out there for the taking, right? Exactly. There was actually a discussion um, amongst before the state was created. And they were trying to decide what to name the new state. And some people actually said, let's name ourselves Judean again, because we have gone through 2,000 years now as Jews all through our history. And someone else said, um, uh, no, let's call ourselves Palestinians because we're in the land and the land has been known as Palestine for all these years. And the Jews who remained here were known as Palestinians. So let's call it Palestine. Let's keep the name Palestine. And then the decision was made to actually the other... The third choice was to go back to Israel because that was the very, very first name when the people were all united under one kingdom. And mm. that was the correct choice. Um, the truth is, in retrospect, had they called it uh, Israel-Palestine, it would have saved a lot of heartache and a lot of lies yeah. uh, and a lot of terror. Wow. Wow. Now, you know, I'm listening to you talk and... Uh, uh, I know that there's a lot of rhetoric in the world about sort of Israel-Palestine relations, but but you don't sound uh, anti-Palestinian to me. You just sound like somebody who's interested in the truth and and allowing the truth to help help Israel make good decisions. Would that be a, a good characterization? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Not only we have it, what, what started something very funny in recent years. I, I lecture around the world. I lecture in, in parliaments. Uh, I also lecture on campuses. And what was happening was I was lecturing on campuses in, in the United States. And, um, and very often I would have Muslims come up to me afterward or, or even speak up during the lecture. 
and and say that they're outraged at what the Palestinian Authority is doing to their people. They're outraged that they're brainwashing their children to want to kill and to want to be martyrs. Um, and and what's happened is we we started keeping in touch with these Palestinians, with these Muslims, and now what's happened is that within Israel, we have had Palestinians turning to us. And we are now working with Palestinians who just want Palestinian Media Watch material to get more exposure because mm. they know, they know that they will never have a decent future with the Palestinian leadership. Uh, they know it. They, they desperately would prefer Israel to absorb all of them into the state of Israel. They look at, at Israeli Arabs. Israeli Arabs are all through the Israeli universities. Israeli Arabs are uh, all through the economy right now. They're learning high tech. They, have, they, 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 ha they are the only ones in the Middle East that have democracy, really, uh, have a real democracy about artificial voting in some of these Muslim and Arab states. But the only ones that have real democracy are, so they, they see this and they're jealous. Mm. Palestinians are seeing this and they're jealous. And, and all they want is for Israel to, so these Palestinians are working with us. And, and I've actually, um, one, of, uh, one of these people who I'm close with joined me at a meeting um, with, uh, with European members of parliament, uh, actually from the Netherlands. And I made a presentation. I showed films from Palestinian TV. I showed quotes from Palestinian school books. I showed what was happening to Palestinian children. And then, and then he spoke. And he, first of all, corroborated everything. And he described that, yes, I, he was brought up on all these va hate values by the PA. Mm. And then he started going on telling about what it's like to be Palestinian and, um, and, and how much they suffer under this leadership and they don't give them freedom of anything. Um, and one of them said to him, well, maybe it would be better if you had an independent state. And he responded, oh, no, oh, no. That would be the worst thing. If we have a, an independent state with this leadership, we will never have freedom. We'll never have democracy. We'll never have rights. We'll never have anything. Um, and they said, what do you want? He says, I, I want Israel to take us over somehow. And then they said to him, well, Israel can't take you over because, look, you just saw the, the way all the youth have been brought up. And he said, yes, I don't blame Israel for not accepting us and giving us citizenship because we've all been poisoned. Uh, so it was a fascinating, hmm. um, a wow. fascinating uh, exchange. And we're trying to create some kind of, um, it, it's hard to find these people. And I'll tell you why, because even he is afraid to find out the origin, the, the actual opinions of, of his neighbors and friends, because people who have moderate opinions, who really want peace with Israel, who blame the PA for all their people suffering, those people end up in jail and, be, and are tortured. So he doesn't want to end up that way. So he can't even, in other words, Palestinians who want peace with Israel are quietly having meetings with Israelis, uh, but they can't publicly start a movement because that would be the end of their lives, certainly the end of their freedom. Wow. Well, that, and that confirms, I think, something that um, that I've always suspected and, and have heard different times is that is that Palestinians, if they uh, really truly want peace, would actually be... Uh, in danger uh, from the hands of their own government. Yes, they are. And, and the number of, uh, a lot of them are speaking out publicly um, in, in recent times. And like I said, there are many, many more who are afraid to speak out publicly. Is the many 10%, 20%, 30%, 50%, 80%, that we don't know because they're afraid to speak out. They have to follow, they have to follow the PA line. We do know, for example, that when Palestinians are asked in polls about Palestinian corruption, Palestinian authority corruption, 80% say that, that they're corrupt. Um, we know that 65, and we're talking about the same numbers for a couple of years now, um, that the PA has corruption. About 65% are constantly saying that they want Mahmoud Abbas to resign from being head of the Palestinian Authority and to hold elections. Um, he was elected, he was elected in in 2006 for a five-year term and he hasn't allowed elections ever since then so wow. there's no democracy there's no freedom there's no freedom mm. of expression there's no freedom of media um so palestinians are just suffering and 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 because they suffer the pa has to keep poisoning and blame the suffering on israel 
I'll tell you something else that they do in order to get support for the hatred is they try to package Islam in a way that it is very, very anti-Semitic. And they're constantly quoting Islamic sources uh, that literally call for uh, hatred of Jews, fighting Jews, destroying Israel. Uh, and I'm talking about the top of the PA leadership. We're talking about a person named Mahmoud al-Habash, who is the hmm. Palestinian Authority. He's right now the head of the Sharia courts, appointed by Abbas. He used to be his advisor, his personal advisor on Islam. Hmm. And just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, he went on TV. Uh, and he said, he starts off with a quote from the Quran that says, to kill them. And he said, who should we be killing? Those that we should be killing the transgressors. And then he says, who are the transgressors? And he lists 10, 10 uh, violations, which are capital crimes, according to him. And he said, if somebody attacks your home, your land, your homeland, your honor. Um, and he goes on, 10 different things. Now, all of these things, the PA has been accusing Israelis of doing. They say when Jews pray on the Temple Mount, we're attacking their honor. So he is, and so he's saying that's a capital crime. And then he says you are obligated by the Quran to to fight them, and he added you're allowed to kill them. So this is the top religious figure in the PA, appointed by Mahmoud Abbas just a few months ago, essentially saying every Israeli has you have an obligation to fight, and you're allowed to kill. The PA says that every bit of Israel, from from Matula to Eilat, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan, every bit of Israel is said to be the Palestinian homeland. They don't deny this. That's the only map that they use. They teach it in their school books. They teach it on TV. And what does this guy come? This top leader says, if they attack your homeland, if they are in your, you have a right, to, you have an obligation to fight and a right to kill. Meaning anytime a Palestinian kills an Israeli, they're fulfilling a religious requirement. Incredible. And by the way, it's not just theory. Let me just tell you a, a, a really, a, a very pointed example of this. Palestinian uh, terrorist, uh, about a year and a half ago, I think it was, went to his workplace, which was north of Jerusalem, which had Arabs and Israelis working together. And because he'd been, there are thousands who are working together in the same area, um, and there had never been a terror attack there. I think security was was lax, and people could just come in. So he brought a machine gun with him. He brought a AK, AK, uh, and he an automatic rifle, and he went to two of his colleagues, a young woman uh, who had a three year old child, a man who was father of three, um, and he just murdered them. The woman he actually tied up, said she would. Literally, he, he literally executed her after he had tied her up. Um, now, this, this terrorist, uh, Ashraf Naala, he then escaped, and he was actually free for about two months before Israel tracked him down and, and killed him while trying to arrest him. But a month and a half after he was arrested, Fatah, which is the party of Mahmoud Abbas, on their Facebook page, wrote the following, Ashraf Naala, Allah is protecting you. In other words, he hadn't been caught because Allah is protecting him. In other words, Fatah is saying that walking into a workplace and killing a young woman in her 20s, a mother of a three, three-month-old, and a young man, father of three, is something that Allah wants, is something that Islam wants. So what we're seeing is the PA is giving these messages to their people, the Palestinian Authority, the moderates, I'm not talking about Hamas, I'm talking about the ones who are supposed to be our peace partners. They give the message to the top religious figure. He goes on TV and says, you have a right, you have, you have an obligation to fight them, and you're allowed to kill them. And then the guy who goes and kills them in cold blood, two civilians, two young people, they then say, Allah is protecting you. Meaning, yes, this is exactly what Allah wants of, of Palestinians. Incredible. Now, you mentioned that was on their Facebook page, and this is yes. one of the things the that you do. The official Facebook page of Fatah, yes. This is one yes. of the things that you do. You you root out in media and and um, um, other sources, uh, you know, where some of these things are happening. Give us some other examples of uh, of the poisoning of the minds of, of this young generation that you've been talking about. 
So uh, one of the the the, the Palestinian leadership um, is constantly giving messages to their children to fight Israelis and to kill them and even to kill themselves. I'm going to show you an example, uh, some examples of, of these videos that have appeared from either official Palestinian TV or on Fatah's Facebook page. So this is the moderate. I want you to see these messages. Okay. فأمه وعدته بها جيزة إن هو أنها صعمة تساءل بجنون لعبة تكون أقبلت أمه بطلة بهية تحمل الهدية نظر إليها فإذا بها بندقية صاح بأعلى صوته يا أمي يا أمي ما هذه أهذه هي الهدية ضمته إليها واحتضنته بيديها وقالت يا بني لم نخلق للسعادة فأنت في نظري مشروع للشهادة فالقدس لنا وسلاحنا إسلامنا ودخيرتنا أبنى واو This Fatah chose to put on their Facebook page. It originally was a radio broadcast, but they got the video. They thought this was an important message to give to Palestinian people, to Palestinian youth on Facebook. There can be no greater child abuse than to come to a child and say to him that you have no inherent value in and of yourself. You are ammunition. Yeah, Our wow. weapon is Islam and you are ammunition. And this is the party of Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, again, horrific, horrific message. We get messages of promoting martyrdom for children all the time. All the time. Uh, on children's programs, on Palestinian television. Uh, I'll give you another example of what it was. Yeah. That's just horrible. أنا الشاب الفلسطيني دم الشهداء يدري في سراييني دقت طبول الحرب أحصد الأرواح بالملايين وسيفي مسلول بلا غمد جيوش الغزر تخشاني وحور العين تهواني أنا ما بعت أوطاني ولا تلمت رشاشي حملت اليوم أكفاني وزاد بقلب إيماني بأن النصر والتحرير على يد الأشباه جيوشك برافو 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 Wow. Again, it's just not imaginable that these are the messages that are coming on children's programs. And she says, bravo, bravo. And this has been going on for years. By the way, what are the results of this? The results of this is that young Palestinians, teenagers, are very, very much involved in the terror that's going on. Uh, last year, we had a, a case, two, I think they were 14-year-old boys or 15-year-old boys. Uh, walked into the, and, and this was caught on camera, so it was very striking. They walked into the old city of Jerusalem and saw some Israeli soldiers who were there, and they both took out knives and ran over and started stabbing the Israeli soldiers. One was shot and killed on the spot, and the other one was shot and injured and was taken off to the hospital. 15-year-old boys. Uh, oh a few years before, it was a 15-year-old boy that went into the home of a, an Israeli woman named Daphne Meir, and in front of her children, she has six children, he just stabbed her to death. He just repeatedly stabbed her while she was screaming and begging for her life, uh, this 16, this 15-year-old boy. Now, I can't imagine a 15-year-old, normal 15-year-old boy, even seeing a dead animal and coming and placing a knife in it over and over again. It's just not something that... No. And yet, he was able to do this to a live human being, to a woman with her children there crying and she's begging. So this is the poisoning. This is the brainwashing of, of Palestinian children. And the Palestinian children are victims as well. Those 14-year-old boys sure. who attacked in the old city, the one who was killed, he'd been brainwashed by his own leaders. When, when, when I see members of parliament around the world, they say, you know, the Palestinian children are suffering, they're victims. I say, of course they're victims. But who has been victimizing them? Right. It's not been Israel. It's been their own leaders who've told them that they are ammunition for Islam in order to go and kill Israelis and be killed doing it. 
And those are the people who should be punished. Agreed. Agreed. That is just, it's just horrible to think that, uh, that children could be used in this way. You know, we, we uh, have seen evidence of, of uh, families, children being used as human shields in terms of, you know, where missile installations are, are put and some of those kind of things. But this, this really is, is even more insidious than that in many ways, isn't it? It's, it's actually, uh, it's arming, uh, arming them essentially with, with the hatred to, uh, you know, to, to carry out these kind of things. It's absolutely uh, heinous. It really is. Um, you know, during the first few months of the uh, COVID-19 crisis around the world, um, Israel did everything that we could to make sure that this didn't reach the Palestinian areas. And Israel was sending hundreds of tons, literally hundreds of tons of supplies, medical supplies. We were having special training sessions for Palestinian doctors. We were sending them tests. We were sending them enough. We were doing everything, everything for them on a daily basis. And while this was happening, we were seeing that Palestinian press was telling their people that Israel was doing everything that it could in order to spread the coronavirus. So here we were helping them, preventing it, and they were up, they didn't mention anything good that we did. They didn't mention anything good. And I'll, I'll give you an example here of a of a cartoon. Uh, of, of, of a cartoon that appeared in the official Palestinian Authority newspaper, which is indicative of this incredible libel um, that was being spread by the Palestinian Authority. Yeah. So this came in, you see here, Al Khayat al Jadida. This is the official newspaper of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and we had statements by the government spokesman saying that Israelis were throwing um, syringes. With with uh, coronavirus uh, in Palestinian areas, that we were spitting on the ATM machines, that we were spitting on car doors and on, on doors of homes, it was a hundred percent libelous, a hundred percent libelous. So you had two different things happening at the same time. Israel was helping the Palestinian Authority, spending tens of millions of shekels um, to send them all this incredible equipment to help them out. And every day, every day, their, their, their people were being filled with these lies. So why would you not expect a 14-year-old then to go out and stab an Israeli soldier? He's been victim, he's a victim of this poison that the Palestinian Authority um, has been giving them, as you see here uh, in this picture. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now, um, the, this is, uh, I think, going to help a lot of people, um, you know, place in their minds a proper idea of what really is happening uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. And, uh, and I say between Israel and the Palestinians, I know for a fact, I've been there many times, uh, Israel is not uh, an aggressor in any of this. Israel is, is a, uh, a defender of themselves and, and their security. But um, what, about, uh, what about pay for murder? This is something that's extremely troubling, and um, uh, you know we we hear little bits and pieces of this. But I remember when we spoke with you uh, a year or so ago. Um, there's just so much evidence of this happening. Okay, so I'm going to show you some slides while I speak. Sorry. Yes, the the Palestinian Authority uh, literally pays their terrorists after they're arrested. Literally pays them for their murders. Uh, according to Palestinian Authority law, uh, every terrorist who is arrested and goes to jail, from the first day that they're arrested, they start getting a salary, and the salary goes up. The longer they're in jail, the higher their salary is. So you have people who are murderers whose who salary keeps going up after many years, and they can reach up to 12,000 shekel a month, which is about um, close to 4,000 U.S. dollars a month, which is about four times the average Palestinian salary. Four times, not 4%, 400% higher wow. than the average salary just because they went to jail. And I'll give you an example here. Abdullah Gabarguti was a Hamas terrorist. Uh, he built the bombs that blew up in this bar restaurant, murdering 15 people, Zion Square, Cafe Moment, Sheffield, all these. Hebrew University, which also killed Americans. 
Uh, Sparrow, by the way, also killed Americans, uh, bus bombing in Tel Aviv. Altogether, he murdered 67 people, uh, and he is serving 67 life sentences. These are the pictures of some of the murderers here. You see a little infant, civilians, men, women, children, everybody, 67 people. How did the PA respond? This is how they responded. They started giving him a salary, and he's already received over 200,000 U.S. dollars. Uh, and it's not just terrorists who kill from afar. You've also got, you also have terrorists like two cousins, Amjad and Hakim Awad. They went into the home of the Fogel family. And with their knives, they murdered Ruth Fogel and Ayud Fogel. And then they literally slit the throats and murdered these four children, an 11-year-old, a four-year-old, and a three-month-old. This is how wow. unbelievably cruel they were. And as soon as they were arrested, they started receiving salary. And today, it's actually a little higher by now. They've received already over $150,000. And by the way, they're, they're giving out, they're giving out uh, hundreds of millions of dollars a year to terrorists, the Palestinian Authority is. And at the same time, they're getting hundreds of millions of dollars and even more in, in financial aid from uh, European countries, uh, the United States, uh, Mm -hmm. only in recent years, uh, decided to stop funding because of this, because of this, the United States stopped. But all through the period of the Obama administration, even though we told everybody in government what was happening, they continued to fund the Palestinian Authority. Um, under, under, uh, under President Trump, this was stopped. Um, and Congress, by the way, the, the, uh, Congress and Senate both passed the law first, so it was not even a Trump initiative. This was a congressional initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the Taylor Force Act, named after an American, uh, Taylor Force, who was murdered in Tel Aviv. He was an American veteran, an army officer, was visiting with his university school to Tel Aviv, and he was stabbed to death. The Palestinian Authority, of course, turned the murderer into a hero. The murderer was killed on the spot. He was turned into a hero, and his parents started receiving a lifetime, literally a lifetime monthly payment because their son had died murdering, uh, murdering Taylor Force. So this is the Palestinian Authority. Uh, their messages, their payments, there is no reason in the world to see them as anything other than a terror organization. Wow. Now what... <laughs> Sorry, what do you think uh, another country would do if there were, uh, you know, constant targeted attempts on the lives of their citizens? Uh, how, how would another country take that? Would it not be considered an act of war? Of course, every country considers it an act of war. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll tell you something very interesting. Just a few days ago, I gave a Zoom lecture to members of European Parliament. And I presented a new report that Palestinian Media Watch just released, which is called Two Loopholes in European Union Anti-Terror Funding Laws. And what we did is we showed them, I showed them in this presentation, that the things that the Palestinian Authority are doing are actually criminal in Europe. If, if a terrorist would be glorified in Europe, according to European Union law, the terrorists would have to be arrested. Now, the Palestinian Authority glorifies every single terrorist, rewards every single terrorist, promotes, finances all of this. Um, and Europe is giving them money while they're doing it. And I said to them, I said, if, if, if Mahmoud Abbas would travel to Europe and he would say these things there or do these things there, you'd have to arrest him. It's not a head of state. No, no state. He has no immunity. You would literally have to arrest him. But he's doing it here and you're paying him to do it. How could that be? And I, I said to them, don't, don't civilians around the world deserve the same protection that the civilians of the European Union? You made these laws criminalizing terror promotion and terror glorification. You criminalized these because you wanted to give your civilians protection. <coughs> Why don't we Israelis deserve the same protection, our civilians? And the members of parliament who were listening were very, very receptive, very agreeable. And we're hoping, we're hoping that there'll be amendments to European Union laws yeah. because the situation today is unimaginable. And to answer your question, you said, what would happen if they were doing these things in their country? My God, they would be right away put in jail. And if it was right. in any, a neighboring country, they would be 
they would be attacked and defeated. Yeah. I asked the same question, uh, you know, in the last couple of years as uh, these, you know, quote unquote, peaceful protests have been happening, uh, you know, on the Gaza border and, uh, uh, you know, worldwide news attention. And yet the news that that gets heard here in North America is news about, uh, you know, an Israeli soldier shooting somebody trying to breach the fence, not about the the absolute bedlam that is going on, you know, uh, in these peaceful, quote unquote, protests. Yeah, yeah, where they they discovered the Palestinian Authority have initiated so many different terror methods. And in Gaza, one of the terror methods that they initiated is they literally started putting uh, bombs as well as incendiary devices and Molotov cocktails on balloons. And the wind was going, and the wind generally goes from the sea inward, so the wind was always taking these things. So every Friday and even during the week, they were sending in, uh, I think it was 25% of the uh, national parks in the area of Gaza were burnt down to the ground. Hmm. 25% national parks. Beautiful, beautiful places of nature and where people you'd hike, and they burnt them down. This is, and, and did you hear a complaint or criticism from any Palestinian? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Well, why is it, uh, and, and maybe we'll, we'll sort of start to wrap up the conversation here, but why is it that, you know, we don't hear a lot about these things in the media, both the good that Israel is doing for the Palestinians and the, the bad that the Palestinians are doing towards Israel? Why aren't we hearing about this in North America? Unfortunately, um, many journalists have an agenda, and that's first of all. But also many journalists go on momentum. In other words, if, if one journalist has only been promoting this, this misinformation of Israel being the, the bad one, the Palestinians being innocent victims, uh, then that some, anyone else who's coming onto staff, that's the message that, that the that mm. the TV station that the newspaper is expecting that's what they want to hear. So it then goes on momentum. I have had a good success with one-on-one -on -one meetings with journalists, but uh, it's a drop in the bucket considering you know compared to the hundreds of journalists who are here in Israel. Uh, and we try to convince them that they're missing they're missing the story. Uh, and like I say, many of them uh, do then write change the story. Uh, but then they leave and the, no the next journalist is coming and he already in his mind is convinced of the message he has to prove. He has to prove bad things about Israel mm. and he has to prove good things about Palestinians. And they come in with this piece. So you've got to literally uh, be constantly tracking down all the new journalists. And then they wonder, hmm, how come I never heard this before? Maybe it's not true. So this is what we're dealing with. This is what we're dealing with. And it, it is tragic. It is unfortunate. There are certain there is certain media which gives a more, much more balanced picture and and there's no balance here there, I mean, that presents i should call it you know presents the israeli side um, accurately and the palestinian side accurately but unfortunately they're they're few and far between yeah now um you know our audience is uh, would be primarily christian and uh you know christians uh, in general, not all, but in general, Christians would be supportive of uh, of Israel, of of the idea of Zionism and and Israel's right to statehood and all of those things. Um, so, two things: one, uh, what are some good media outlets that Christians could sort of connect into that will give them, um, you know, solid news about what's happening in Israel and and between Israel and Palestine? That's the first one. Yeah, I, th I think the best station is, I'm trying to remember, I think it's called CNN, uh, not CNN, uh, CBN. Can I answer that, right? Is that, is that the Christian, Christian Broadcasting Network? Network? Yeah, I think CBN? so. CBN? Yeah. Yeah, the CBN. Um, they interview PMW regularly. They, they, they do our stories regularly. Um, the second thing that I could, I could really recommend to, to, your, to your listeners and to your viewers is that they should come to our website. Our website is palwatch.org. Uh, and first thing you should do is subscribe to get our 
to get our bulletins. Uh, look for material on the website. It's very easy to, it's got a great search engine. You can put in the tags and put okay. in any combination of messages that you want to find. You could put in children, fatah, hatred, and you'll get all the examples that we've collected over the years. But most important is get on our email list that you can get our, our, uh, our press releases. Because what we have found is that um, people can impact on the media. Uh, and we have a number of places where there are people who've organized. And if there's a bad story in the media that about Israel, they will together in, a, in an organized fashion, they will bombard that media station uh, with emails, showing them the true facts, showing them the films like the ones I showed you, showing them what's right. really happening. Um, you know, someone will come along and say, Mahmoud Abbas has promoted peace. Well, they'll show them. And, and there have been changes. There have been changes in apologies and stories. So I, I ask all of your viewers to, to, a, to go to palwatch.org, get our bulletins, and then become active, active in promoting truth around your region. Um, you could theoretically write to us and even ask for a copy of my PowerPoint presentation that I present to journalists. I will send you a copy of my PowerPoint presentation. You can then you know, you could have meetings with a journalist and you walk mm -hmm. in and say, listen, I think you've been missing an important part of the story. I want to show you important information. You'll have all the videos, you'll have all the information. You can go ahead and do it. Um, this is what we like people to do, to become more active. We want PMW's material to be out there, to be a tool for people who are, want to spread the truth, uh, spread the truth. And like I said, go to our website, write to us. We'll send you copies of, of the full presentation, of which you've okay. seen just a few slides today. Yeah, and, and so you answered my second question, which is, you know, how can how can Christians help their friends to understand these issues? And I think uh, you've just given some great uh, information about that. I'll include, uh, you know, that information in the uh, in the write up below the uh, the video, but also, uh, you know, on the closer of the audio podcast. And so. I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we had a little bit of. Uh, 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 time lapse getting this all set up, but uh, glad you got your computer fixed and everything's working well. I don't. I don't. I'm on a different computer. Oh, you're on a different computer. Oh no. It kept, it kept crashing again and again and again, and finally I had to. Like, oh my. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyhow, uh, really appreciate you taking the time. I um, thank you for your work as well. It's it's extremely important work that you're doing, and uh, you know, as uh, as a Christian, you know. My my way to support you one way is is to pray that uh, you know that that God will continue to bless you in your work and and uh, I know that others will be doing that as well. So um, thanks so much and have a fantastic day. Thank you very much, you too, evening. and all the listeners as well. Evening, right? It's evening there. It's yeah. evening in Israel. Yes, it we'll is. let you go have your dinner. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. God bless. Shabbat shalom. Okay. Shabbat shalom. Bye. Thank you for tuning into the podcast today. It has been great to have you with us, and I hope you enjoyed my interview with Itamar. We heard and learned a lot of information today about what is happening in the media when it comes to the Palestinian Authority and the message that they are trying to send the world. It is uh, twisted, it is false, it is unfair in most cases. And so I want to encourage you, get involved. Itamar suggested that we you know, subscribe to their website, to their email updates, and that when we see unfairness, when we see information that's being reported inaccurately, that we should do something about that. And I would encourage you, go to their website, palwatch.org. That is P-A-L-W-A-T-C-H dot O-R-G. And there you can subscribe to their email updates and get all the information that you need. And we would encourage you to do that. I remind you also that First Century Foundations is a ministry that is helping over 70 Christian and Messianic ministries in the land of Israel. We are helping to support them as they reach out to their communities with uh, humanitarian aid, with all kinds of help uh, for Holocaust survivors and lone soldiers and many others who are in need in the land of Israel. This is a way for you to make your donations go to work in Israel and help people come to know the truth about Yeshua, who is the Messiah. So I would encourage you, if you can help us, please make your donation at firstcenturyfoundations.com forward slash donate. 
That's First Century Foundations with an S dot com forward slash donate. And it would just be so helpful to us. We appreciate you tuning in and listening every week. God bless you. And remember, as Christians, we stand with Israel. <laughs>